It's 2020, and vampires stalk the land. Okay, well, not those kind of vampires. Uh, this this kind of vampire. See, I can do Halloween-themed tie-in episodes like all the cool YouTube channels. Yeah. Now, if you cast your mind back to October last year, you know, before stuff happened, the Vampire version 4 was unveiled at Amiga 34 in Germany, and then promptly sold out within the first 45 minutes. And 12 really long months later, it became my turn to buy one. And here we have it. If you're into the Amiga scene, I'd be pretty surprised if this is the first time you've heard about the Vampire, you know, just me talking about it on this channel. And even if you're not into the Amiga, there's a reasonable chance this is not the first time you've heard of the Vampire cards. There have been a number of Vampire cards before this one that have really wowed Amiga users. And if you know someone who's got one of those things, chances are they've not shut up about it for quite a while. The first Vampire card was released for the Amiga 600, possibly the least loved of the Amiga range. Initially Commodore had intended it as a low-cost Amiga, the Amiga 300. As they were about to retire the Commodore 64, I wanted a low-cost computer to soak up that section of the market. However, in true Commodore style, they managed to somehow make the Amiga 300 cost more than the Amiga 500, so they renamed it the Amiga 600 and then released it. Now, one of the ways they'd attempted to cost reduce the A600 was to remove the edge connector from it, but then they decided to stick on a PCMCIA card slot instead, which was one of the reasons why it was so expensive. Third-party hardware vendors didn't exactly flock to produce add-ons for the A600, as it was difficult, and the A600 had not sold in quite the volume to warrant it. So it meant if you wanted an accelerator for the A600, you were a bit short of options. Then came along a rather clever chap who decided to make the first ever vampire card. Now the first ever vampire card had a rather clever way of attaching to the A600. The vampire had a socket mounted on the underneath of it, which you pushed over the CPU on the A600's board. The pins of that socket then make contact with every single line going into the CPU. Kind of like teeth, you know, from a vampire, hence the name. This meant the accelerator could pick up all the signals it needed, whilst getting around the problem that the A600's processor couldn't be removed because it was surface mounted to the board. And of course you didn't have that edge connector like you had in the A500. One of the things that made the first Vampire distinct over other accelerator cards, apart from being the fact that it worked on the A600, was that instead of just using a regular Motorola based chip like a 68030 or 40 or 60, it used an FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. An FPGA is essentially reprogrammable hardware, and into this hardware they put their own implementation of the 68000. Now this didn't just come out of nowhere, there was a previous project called Natami, or Native Amiga, which is intended to create a whole new Amiga system based on modern hardware. And as part of that project, they created a new software CPU, called the N68050. When the team behind that CPU left the Natami project, they joined the Vampire project, and that core became the 68080. After the first Vampire card, soon comes the Vampire 2. Yes, the, the second card. This is when interest in the Amiga community really explodes around this thing, because not only does it have the really powerful processor that was in the original Vampire card, now they've added retargetable graphics. This means suddenly your Amiga 600 can output in 1080p with full 24-bit colour. Also, now we've got a chunky pixel mode rather than the planar mode, which is really great for 3D games. So this now means that the lowly A600 with one of these things is basically the most powerful Amiga ever built, or at least 68,000 based Amiga ever built. And the Amiga community unsurprisingly goes pretty nuts for this thing. Demand massively outstrips supply because there's just two people making them essentially, with a waiting list as long as your arm, assuming your arm's at least a year and a half in length. I'm not joking actually, when I clicked the I would like one button and a year and a half later I got the email saying it's your turn to buy one, can we have some money please? I mean I tried my best to wait quietly but yeah that, that was a hard year and a half. After a while of people still marvelling over the fact that the A600 was now the most powerful Amiga, the Vampire team finally released a version for the A500, which is something A500 owners have been waiting for for quite a while. Now this one was a bit easier to make, because all you had to do was have a 68,000 pin adapter on the bottom of it, so you just popped out your CPU, put this thing in instead. It's a lot easier to install. But as you can imagine, it did not have a short waiting list either. I mean, people waited a long time to lay their hands on this thing. Also, conveniently, it would fit in all the other 68,000 based Amigas. So, the 2000, the original Amiga now called the 1000. You can even pop one in a CD TV, although there are some ROM issues there which I don't quite fully understand, and I'm not going to research for the purposes of this video and a, just a throwaway comment about it being available for CD TV. Most of the work after the Vampire 2 for the A500 comes out seems to concentrate on improving the CPU core and other bits around that. 
and they do a cracking job of it. I mean, they really iron out a lot of the bugs, they introduce a floating point unit, some memory management, and something called AMX, which is essentially the Amiga equivalent of the single instruction multiple data stuff that came in with MMX on the PC. Eventually the team announced that they're going to release the Vampire 4 at some point in the future, which is not going to be a souped up board for all the other Amigas, no, this is going to be a standalone machine, much more like the whole Nat Ami concept. They also tell us that we're going to get V2 for the 1200 as well, which frankly I've been waiting for since the beginning of this whole thing started. Right, time to get a look at this thing. Yeah, after clicking the I would like one of these buttons, the second there was a I would like one of these buttons, one short year later, here's mine. Let's unbox this thing. Ooh, I'm finally hitting all the YouTube tropes. Maybe I should ask you to like and subscribe and smash bells and stuff. Okay, don't smash your bell, just, just, just click on it like a normal person. That, that'd be lovely. So inside the box we find we got the vampire itself. A little power adapter to make it all work. I ordered this one with a little mouse as well because I didn't have a spare USB mouse, so, you know, I was going to need a USB mouse. I mean, it looks a little garish, but oh, okay. Ooh, it comes with sweeties. Nice. I can do a review on those later if you like. I suspect they're going to be chewy. Right, let's get the vampire itself out of its box. Ooh, two unboxing videos in a row. How exciting. As you can see, it's housed in this rather simple yet quite nice little metal case. With all the ports being at either one end or the other. Now we should probably have a quick chat around the specs with this thing as I generally film it to make it look nice from different angles. Now the main star of the show is still the 68080 CPU they put in there, which still makes it one of the fastest CPUs there is for the Amiga. And given that they've got a slightly faster FPGA in this thing than the other ones, this probably should be just a little bit more performant than the other versions as well. We've still got the same retargetable graphics we had before, but now there's an implementation of the AGA chipset in this thing, which means when we play a game, we don't have to swap the input on the screen from HDMI to the Amiga's analog signal, which is going to be absolutely lovely. Now you can see there's a couple of USB ports lurking on this thing, and at the moment that's just for the mouse and keyboard. The idea though is that they'll get some proper USB support at some point onto these things. We also have Ethernet built in for connecting to a network, which is rather nice. On previous cards you had to buy a £10 external Ethernet card to go on this thing, so it's nice to have it built in. Now memory wise this thing's got a whopping 512 meg, which you know may not sound a lot to you for a modern computer, but for an Amiga that is an incredibly large amount of memory. Alright, I think it's time we probably got the case off this thing so you can have a look at the bare board. Ooh, saucy. Now you can see there's a little compact flash adapter sat on mine, because again, I ordered it with one because I didn't have one spare or a spare compact flash card. And this is what you use as essentially the hard drive replacement to get the thing to boot. If we lift it off though, you can now see the FPGA that basically runs this whole thing. You can also see these little header ports. One is for attaching an extra Ethernet adapter, just like the same in the Vampire 2 for the A500. And the other one lets us reprogram the FPGA so we can take core upgrades and this hardware can be improved over time. If you also look at the far end, we've got a couple of nice joystick slash mouse connectors that take the old Amiga style devices. And at the opposite end, we've got a little SD card slot for a bit more storage. Right, let's get this thing hooked up to a capture card so you can get a little bit of footage of what this thing can do. Right, after a short boot period, the first thing you'll notice is it drops into Workbench. But Workbench looks a little different than it might do on the normal Amiga OS. Firstly, we've got this great big Apollo OS splash screen there. The other thing you might notice is the primary hard disk is called AROS, rather than say Workbench. Now there is a reason for this. Instead of going with the old Kickstart and classic Amiga OS, they've gone for the open source alternative. Now this is probably because the classic Kickstart and OS are kind of littered with a whole bunch of copyright issues, so they've neatly sidestepped all of this by going with AROS. Now for those not familiar with AROS, this project's been running for quite a long time, and it was to create an open source version of the Amiga operating system. Now I must admit, I've not really gone near this thing for like the last 8 or 9 years, as when I was using it, it was principally focused on x86 as its main sort of engine to run upon. 
But with the Vampire coming along, the 68,000 version has got a lot more attention, and the Apollo OS guys have decided that, you know, this is the OS they're going to concentrate on. So, this is what came in the compact flash card I ordered, and this is what I'm going to try using it with. Now, in case you're wondering, can I run the classic Amiga OS? Yes, yes, you can. You just have to sort of mess around with ROMs and provide your own version of Kickstart and start flashing things into the FPGA, and there's a whole bunch of instructions. You can do it, it's just... Well, I kind of want to experience it this way, to be honest. Right, we've not actually run a benchmark on this thing yet. People really love to see benchmarks on this thing, so let's run a benchmark. Ooh, I really am doing well for the whole YouTube tropes thing today. Now, as you can see, if we hit the speed button, yep, we have a really, really fast Amiga. It's ludicrously fast. There we go. See, that little line shows us how fast it is. And if we test the drive speed, we can see, well, that's really fast for an Amiga as well. Yeah, well, 11 mega second, that's, that's pretty good. We could even run some other benchmarks, like this is a proper hardware review. Here it is running AIBB. We're even gonna run the Savage test. Oh look, it's really fast. Actually, this tool can show us something that is actually maybe of slight interest. If you run some of the tests that do some graphics, we'll see it's not actually that much ahead of the regular Amiga. That's because, of course, it's trying to have to run the whole same custom chipset as the actual Amiga itself. It's an alternative implementation, it's a bit faster, its memory access is a bit faster, but it's not that much faster, because if it was, well, it wouldn't be that compatible with the Amiga, and, well, we want it to be compatible with the Amiga. Right, I think it's time to start playing some games on this thing. After all, that's what you all want it for, right? I mean, it's what I want it for, mostly. So let's pick a game that's going to show off the big feature of the Vampire 4, which is the fact that you can do AGA graphics. So we're going to choose Zul 2 AGA. Now, okay, we've we, we, we've got a bit of glitching here in the menus. Um, yup. This, this thing's not entirely perfect. I mean, to be fair, the Vampire 2 had similar problems to this. Well, not in terms of graphics, because it didn't do the AGA chipsets, but it did have little CPU bugs and things that would make things crash. And as time went on, well, they updated it. That's the nice thing about an FPGA. You can download and update to your hardware. So I dare say the Vampire 4 is going to improve over time. And as we can see, it runs the main game just fine. I mean, I'm not brilliant at it, but, you know, it runs it just fine. I mean, the lag through the capture device is driving me nuts. Just to make my coverage of this thing a little bit even-handed. Um, there are bad things as well. I mean, here's me trying to load flashback. It just sort of crashes and dies. And to be honest, I don't know if that's a problem with the Vampire 4 itself, not quite being the same as the original hardware, or whether this is an AROS thing, you know, not quite being the same as the original operating system. Of course, we don't just have to play games that targeted the AGA chipset. No, we can play games that targeted the Amiga's original chipset. So let's play one of my favourites, Turrican 2. I'll put this up for a while and you can admire the shootiness of it. It's, it's very shooty. Now, after watching all of this, you're probably thinking, so is he going to tell us if we should buy one of these things or not then? So I'm going to attempt to cover exactly that. If you're an Amiga purist who's, you know, really into the original hardware and you just don't like the idea of FPGA, then the Vampire 4 definitely is not for you. I mean, this is a thoroughly modern implementation of the Amiga, entirely done in FPGA, and if you're only into the original hardware, then yeah, um, you, you're not gonna love this. However, if you want the fastest Motorola 68K based Amiga that you can lay your hands on, well, the Vampire 4 is basically it. I mean, it runs most of the original Amiga games, and that support is gonna increase over time. And also, it has one heck of a party trick, in that it can run Quake 2 faster than, well, my PC at the time could, so, you know, that's, that's pretty impressive for an Amiga. It'll also let you play some of the later Amiga games that came out, the ones that required a really high-spec system, like Nema or Payback. Those games really wouldn't run on even, you know, most upgraded Amigas. You really needed a pretty high-end machine to run them, and the Vampire gives you a pretty affordable way of doing that. Now, I'll just show you one more final game. I'll pop on the Killing Game Show. This is one of my favourites as a kid from Psygnosis. And while you watch me bimble around not quite as competently as perhaps I used to, I'm going to say thank you very much for watching. And as ever, if you found this video interesting, please share it with people you think also might find it interesting. And of course, it would be great if you could subscribe to the channel, because that makes a huge difference to tiny channels like this one. Oh, I should also probably mention things like smashing bells and whatnot, but, you know, you just click it so the subscribe button does the thing that you thought the subscribe button was actually going to do. 